that's a, again one of the kind of the thoughts if we listen to the speakers here is, is goes more into the afternoon but again the use of cover crops and the conservation practices that we're trying to preach is not that it's new concepts it's that we're trying to add a new twist on what we've had before uh, we may be familiar with the old uh, horse drawn van grunt drill that we uh, our grandfathers interceded in corn with you know so now we've got fancy new stuff right pneumatic delivery uh, large equipment do the same type of thing that we were doing before. And as well as the potential, you know. So here's a high clearance tractor with drill boxes put on it back in the 30s or 40s. And now we've got uh, Mike Shooter in Indiana with the Don Doocy units on his nitrogen toolbar here. So putting on 28 and cover crop at the same time. So there's a lot of things to think about. And we're hoping that our speakers today really get our minds working in that direction. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Lucas Criswell, who is a farmer from Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, he serves on the, the, no -till, the Pennsylvania No-Till Alliance Board, and his family farm adopted no-till in the mid-80s and has been 100% no-till since the 90s. So they farm about 1,800 acres of uh, corn, soybeans, rye, peas, and canola, maybe among other things. And he also operates uh, an ag services business, provides Line and fertilizer applications and sells ag leader decisions. Nope. Big busy guy. Big. Fortunate that he takes his time out to come speak with us. And if you have anything else to introduce yourself, go right ahead. I'll get you. This thing only if it is. Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank the Brandt family for inviting me here. Um, it's quite an honor, I guess, to be asked to speak here at the master cover crop himself, Mr. Brandon, and Jay's farm. Um, we had Jay in our county, I saw our conservation district, we had Jay, uh, Dave in at a, our county about a year and a half ago, and he was uh, blown away by the amount of cover crops that uh, were planted in our county in December. Um, our area had a lot of steel wheel, horse and buggy guys, uh, but they were big tillage, in the 90s, and uh, the, that's why I was talking to uh, Dan this morning here, that trying to figure out what the difference is coming in from uh, driving in from the interstate, coming in here to Dave's, realize that there's very few cover cropping going on, and no-till, let alone just cover cropping. And uh, trying to figure out what the big difference is in our area, how it was adopted. Um, it's more of a unique community in our area that they start seeing one successful farmer doing something and they're gonna, they wait and see if they fail first. And I've heard a lot of talk in the back of my, back behind my back to see if we were gonna fail. And um, it's, uh, of course we haven't failed, we're still here. Um, so there's been a, a slow adoption of just following what, what neighbors have done in our area. And I know around here, just to, just a 15 minute drive in for the interstate, I was, I was out of money so I got to Dave's place because all I seen was tillage, more tillage, and deep ripping. I don't know. I don't. I, it's it's amazing how everybody's uh, philosophy on sustainability is different. But um, this quote here, it's more of a quote than really a, a title of my talk. But um, some of you might know uh, Jim Harbach, uh, big dairy farmer in um, in our area. He brought said this here not too long ago, he's like, we're doing it all for the wrong reasons. Meaning, we've, there's a lot of people in, no, in Pennsylvania have been no-tilling for a long time, but within the last 10 years, we started to realize why, what we're doing and the results we're seeing and the differences we're seeing in our soils. And Jay asked me to kind of talk about my, uh, my uh, history on how I, got, how I got started with my dad and such and where we are with planting the big covers. Of course, one of the main reasons why a lot of us, at least for me, why I'm doing what I'm doing and hoping to have a good stake in the farming community is uh, doing it for the next generation. Um, my three boys, uh, 10, 7, and 3, and it's kind of funny that uh, when I was 10 years old, I was doing some plowing, and uh, my son this fall actually planted about 100 acres of cover crop with a 15-foot drill. So. His take on things are a little bit different. My, my biggest gripe is trying to fight with him over a farming simulator that 
that European version, all it is, a lot of tillage. You got to till first before you plant everything. We have a lot of conversations when we're playing video games, but. <laughs> this is my dad. Um, my wife would put the bottom in fine print, but he was an early innovator, but I also say he's my biggest critic. I mean, anybody not work with their dad is not a critic. Um, my dad and I, um, my dad and I worked together early on. We still do, but we tried a partnership, drove my mom nuts, so I ended up having my own operation, but we farmed together, so. Any of these crazy ideas, he's like, you try it on yours first to see if you fail. Well, I always would. And two weeks into, he's like, why aren't you doing that on my ground? I was like, well, you just told me you didn't want it. Well, you can try a little bit. So he's my, uh, he's my biggest brake pedal, I guess. But I have my foot on the accelerator pretty hard. Um, of course, back in the, my dad bought the farm. He uh, started out with another neighboring farmer, got the farm equipment. Uh, we can see a common theme here. I mean, there's a lot of case in my history, but um, we were doing a lot of tillage. My dad was working a lot of different different jobs, working for other farms, and that's why he got me started at a young age. I mean, I don't remember anything else but bouncing my head back and forth here between these roll bars back here doing the tillage and stuff and ended up I think that's what kind of knocked some sense into me that we didn't have to do this forever. But, um, just to show that we came, I came from the years of learning out, learning about why, why tillage is destructive. I mean, we just ran the wheels off of everything. This is a little 830 case that I broke the axle right off of it, plowed in one year. <clears throat> the reason why my dad started to no-till Oh, I'll talk to my wife about that. that didn't Dad had a full-time job. Um, of course, he had a full-time job because with the mail out because farming wasn't supportive. And uh, learned real fast to save a lot of fuel, save time, less wear on equipment. And um, my dad wasn't a high input farmer. And that's something that I can't relate with with farmers that have been fertilizing to the T by a soil test and by university recommendations. Um, my dad went to Vietnam out of high school and uh, never really went to college. He went to uh, a drafting school to try and dodge the draft, but that didn't happen. They still got him, but, but he started farming, had a passion for farming, <clears throat> but he just never really focused on, um, we didn't have ground that, that uh, was the high end for our area, but he always seemed to make it work and <clears throat> I never was inundated with having to, to put everything on that uh, the experts recommended. And I think that's what's helped my early adoption of low input farming that we've been doing for the last uh, 10 years, 15 years even. But we still chiseled our soybeans <clears throat> and, uh, and more were plowed. And what, talking with uh, Dave last night, <clears throat> Seeing the amount of tillage out here, and he says they're still doing no-till soybeans, and he's like, I just don't get it. He's like, you're saying the guy go out here and deep rip, get rid of compaction, and it all makes sense because back when we were still chisel pounding for soybeans, there was years I remember going out with the disc trying to break the ground up to be able to get the no-till plant or a corn plant in the ground. Of course, now it all makes sense because we still had that tillage pass in there, and when it would dry out, we still had the poor soil structure. Hardest thing putting this presentation together is we all know the adoption of the smartphone and any cell phones we had. We seemed like everything's captured in pictures. And back in the 90s, there's very few pictures to be had. But I scrounged through a couple to find that in 93 is when we bought our first no till drill. Uh, the branch were like this. I, we did have a Krauss. I wore out two Krauses. Um, I, out of high school in 96, I was planting 100 acres of custom no-till soybeans for a bunch of neighbors. It was an uh, early thing and um, unique opportunity for me to get on other farms and see the differences on farms. And um, it's amazing 
to see the difference in the amount of weight that we had to put on different farms that were still in some tillage practices to realize the, the penetration we needed to get to get in farms that haven't been no-tilled for so long. And <clears throat> you don't realize how spoiled you are working on your own operation until you get to some other doing custom work. Um, in the early 90s is when we pretty much went 100% no-till. Um, so when I started to come on, we started to see that there's a lot of huge benefits to erosion. And once we got our drill is when we started to do some adoption of cover crops and such. <clears throat> One of my big step forwards in the acres in 2001, a buddy that I went to school with, uh, came to me and he's like, hey, we're putting up a 400 cow dairy barn, do you want to do all the crops for me? And I'm like, of course my dad says, oh, how are you ever going to be able to do that? But I took the challenge. Um, they were farming 600. I only had 200. We put it together and we started 100% no-till with a 400 cow dairy and haul manure. It was my uh, responsibility to haul 6 million gallons of manure annually. And uh, there's a lot of naysayers of how that was ever going to be able to be done, but um, it didn't take long to figure out that uh, our covers was going to be the answer to uh, that ability to fight compaction on any of these operations. Um, How many gallons per acre are we putting down on the covers? Oh, this is in the springtime. Um, we were putting down anywhere from six to 8,000 gallons. So this was a dairy manure. Um, at that time, they did not have a separator. But uh, we were, uh, it wasn't, uh, it just wasn't a concern that I ever had about compaction. It, it's I, I kind of chuckle when I drive by and Dave took us down to the neighboring farm and everybody's running a subsoiler. Now our soils are different. I'm not gonna say that you can we're perfect and that we don't have any clay. Uh, our soil is gonna withstand some compaction, but still it's a mindset change of getting into a, 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 a tedious uh, management system of just getting the cover crops in as fast as possible with dealing with the manure traffic and dealing with the corn sods traffic. Um, <clears throat> this is what the fields look like in the fall. Can't quite see in this picture, but there are a lot of truck tracks on home manure across here. And of course, in end of mid-May, we'd mow it off and chop the rye, trucks again. Um, it's amazing that having this huge root mass of this ride just really was forgiving in, in what we could do. Um, I worked with this dairy for about eight years. When dairy price, when grain prices started to go up, we couldn't quite see eye to eye on forages that I was selling them, so we kind of split ways. We, I did think on this operation that people would just say it just couldn't be done because we're, of course, I didn't follow university guidelines, I guess. Because, of course, me not going to university at all, I kind of uh, did what needed to be done. We're trying to get some alfalfa established and wheat cover crop and yeah, wheat stubble. Having some slug issues. We didn't really know what slugs were too bad, just that something was eating our alfalfa and I didn't like it. So we started to adopt, I started to adopt amongst against the dairy farmer's perspective. He didn't want me to plant shorter season corn. He didn't like it because it messed up his whole chopping schedule. But we chopped corn in beginning of September, seed alfalfa, and we have some of our best stands of alfalfa to do that. And uh, it's just, uh, it's hard to change the farmer's mindsets. That's when I started to realize it's difficult to work with another farmer that doesn't have the same vision that you do. Just to show that I've done a little bit of everything on my farm. Um, the big rant and rave there years ago in our area was they were going to pelletize switchgrass. And so we actually bought a pellet mill, had a whole little system set up. We were grinding up corn fodder bales and straw to pelletize them. And it's kind of going against my grain. It didn't feel right, but I was something we just had to try and do. And, um, one of those chapters that I've kind of forgot about, but I don't do some pictures I saw, it, it kind of adds to the hype of trying to figure out 
to be diversified in your operation, and I soon figured out this was not one to be diversified by. And this is one thing, I'm not afraid to have a failure. Um, I'm not afraid to put some money into something to try it. We didn't lose our rear end, but it is, there's always opportunity, and not to be afraid to stick your neck out and try something. And, um, and that goes with everything with farming. Um, there is so much peer pressure out there and negativity against, um, I guess I'm not a young guy anymore, but I still classify my young self, young guy, but um, don't you have to be young, just trying something different than the standard uh, procedure in your area. It's amazing we go to a lot of these uh, no-till meetings. You're sitting around at the end of the day and guys get talking and they're from different areas of the states and just like Dave right here, it, it, it's like a little island of, uh, of uh, no-till and cover crop that's going on and you need a lot of support if you're going to be sticking out in the crowd and be a little bit different. Um, like Jay said, the, the sport in this room is huge. Don't be afraid to uh, see somebody recognize and holler at you and say hello introduce yourself and uh, create a network. I know uh, I got to know Blake Vince a couple years ago. He called me up out of the blue with some crazy questions and uh, since then we've been pretty good friends. My world kind of changed and we ran into this guy. Um, I feel honored to be following his footsteps from last year in Rick Haney. I, I don't feel like I deserve this playing field but he's uh, been probably my biggest driving force in challenging me. When we first met him, my first impression is, impression is this guy's nuts. We all heard him. We, we all watched it. But then he did these slate tests. And we're just like, and I was, I mean, we were, wasn't until the mid 2000s, late, early 2000s that I, we heard Ray. And as I said, we were strong in the no-till for a lot of years. But nobody ever really explained it to us how our soil's functions until I think Ray come along and it was quite an eye opener. Um, we figured he had no idea about no-till. He's just a typical NRCS dude that's just splurring out verbiage that he was just getting paid for. Um, we're doing what works, why are we, why are we gonna change? And we just felt that we just continually needed all these chemicals, how we needed, he preached how we need to cut back on pesticides and herbicides and nitrogen and we're like, whatever. This is my operation, I ran into him. We were no-tilling corn and uh, burned off rye residue. Uh, I know there's not much there, because, I mean, the university said it'd be burned off as two or three inches tall, because that was what we needed to do. We were pop up fertilizer nitrogen with the planter at the time. That's what we were doing. Um, but I'm always challenged to think that there's still something else that we're missing and listening to all the experts that we've all heard that <clears throat> in the last couple years that there's always something more and there's a lot of guys in my area I try to get to come to meetings like this they have no interest in it and Jay told me that there's a lot of probably new to cover crops veterans of cover crops are in this room um, I think it's great that you guys all came out to try and learn something from me. I might not have anything new for you, but there's always, I always find there's one little bit of tidbit of information that makes it worthwhile to take home. And that's where my dad's not one to look for those other options, but I am. And I think my son had this in his mind too, looking down, seeing the bear, soybean stubble, and say, Dad, there seems like there's still something missing. This is uh, <clears throat> earlier on, soybean stubble field broadcast, hard rain, see the water ponding, and I feel that's a pretty good success, but looking back now, I realize that we were burning our covers off small, very little root development in that soil structure. That's why we're getting this water ponding. Um, it's pretty neat to look back now and realize what we were doing was good, but not good enough. A lot of talk about companion cropping, relay cropping now, uh, it, seven, eight years ago, I tried it. Um, Ray challenged me to do it. We had a couple plots out. We actually planted the corn. 
day later, we ran a drill right over top of it. Um, I didn't have no grant funding. I, it, it was Lucas Criswell funded. It came out of my own pocket. I had university, I had Penn State University come there. They looked at it and they're just like in awe about it. Well, who told you to do this? Well, Ray Archuleta challenged me. Well, who's he? You know, didn't even know who he was yet. Farmers are farmers in Pennsylvania. I don't know if it's the same in this area, but we brought the experts to PA. We went out to meetings and heard what was going on and brought it back. And it's it's been it's not been a struggle for me to not have university. Not that university is not on my side, but it's been unique being in front of the universities in our in our area. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, but this stuff looked pretty awesome. Come fall, um, on the left here was a, uh, of course back when we did all this, we didn't know much about, I didn't know much about all these species and why it was important and why thinner is better and too thick is not good. I learned it this year, this side of the field had a pretty thick cover, a pretty thick companion with the corn. This was planted the same day. The only herbicide I used on this was a double burn down. We burned it down two weeks before planting and round up right at planting. And that's what blew the, the university's mind. We had a probably 95% clean field just because of two roundup applications. I'm not touting the roundup, I'm just saying this is what we did then. Uh, the yields on this farm, on this plot, um, did pretty good over here. The crops were thinner, but over here we got thicker. Um, Ray recommended a certain uh, cow pea. It didn't like it. It didn't like it at all. It actually almost killed this corn over here. And uh, Ray did a little research, and the certain cow pea I used was detrimental to root development of the corn. Two thousand nine is another year that we had. We started, like I said before, we had some slug issues with uh, trying to get some covers established, now valve established, and can't quite see it real well. But this is a barley field with these huge holes. No till barley into a corn shell corn field, huge holes in this field. And some of you might have heard now, John Tooker uh, from Penn State. We sat him down that fall and said, we have this huge issue with slugs. He's like, I'm an entomologist. I don't deal with slugs or mollusks. And we said, you figure this out, we'll make you a millionaire. He's still waiting for his million to come, but he has been a huge uh, advocate on um, really opening our eyes on what's going on in our fields and what do we need to do to change this. And it's, it's been a unique battle. Um, we were doing a lot of cover crops. <clears throat> we felt the cover crops were bringing, making too good of habitat for the slugs. So we would turn it brown, brown and down is what I called it. We needed to do that to beat the slugs. Um, we didn't really know if they were actually creating some yield disadvantage, but that's all we knew right at the moment was brown and down was going to make us the most beneficial and the corn looked the best. So that's what we did. Um, we're still running a little bit of pop-up fertilizer and nitrogen at the time. I'm not going to get focused on numbers. I'm, I'm not a big numbers guy the amount of nitrogen and stuff we use. Anybody have those questions at the end, you can ask me. I'll go out and share them. So we started to have a little bit of planting green in amongst our brown and down. And the work with uh, John Tucker was doing and some research on my operation, we started to realize that planting green was a huge benefit to learning how to work with the slugs. Um, some of the big changes on my farm once we started to work with Tucker and some of the things that he uncovered uh, was kind of, I say, when we really started to buck the trend of where commercial farming has been going. Um, we stopped using pop-up fertilizer in furrow. Uh, wasn't because of Tucker's research, but it was one of those things that I know back in uh, early 2010 and so, uh, pop-up fertilizer went through the roof. The guy I was getting my fertilizer from, he's like, oh, we can make this affordable. He's like, 
how many gallons you put on? It's like, oh, five gallons. He's like, well, we'll just water that down so the dollar figure matches your what you're used to putting on dollar wise. It's like, so what? Now we're down to a pound of potash and half a pound of phosphorus. And why should you even put it on? Well, you need to put that on, or you're not going to grow your corn. It's like, sorry, we didn't order any of that year and have not used it since. Um, we do have manure history on our farm, so that does benefit us some there also, but I started to look at things a little bit different perspective and just trying to watch my bottom line and my inputs and who was making money off of me. I started to realize everybody else was making money off of me than myself. After some of John Tucker's research, uh, trying to figure out how to build our beneficials to combat these slugs. And it's kind of an aha moment and a V8 moment, I guess I might call it, that our chemical companies, my chemical rep was like, oh my God, you're planting that green cover crop, you gotta have so many bugs and nasty things in there that you have to apply a herb, uh, insecticide or everything. It's only $2.50. And my dad's like, yep, we're going to do it. And I'm like, no, we're not. It's only $2.50. It's like, yep, over 700 acres, that's $1,400. Whoa, that's cheap insurance. I was like, but look at this research, what Tucker has done. Why do we want to, uh, why do we want to go down that road? So, of course, again, I stopped using the sex side of my farm. My dad wanted me to put it on his farm, so I did it. Why are you putting that on my farm? He's like, well, you told me to. <laughs> well, put you it on my farm. It's like, okay. Anybody have, know anybody have that challenge in this room at all? I just think so. <laughs> About this time frame, we also stopped planting treated soybeans. Uh, John Tucker showed us <clears throat> little video of a uh, slug that was in a little petri dish with a treated soy bean that was sprouted and a crabbed beetle that uh, tried to attack it and it just touched it, fell on its back, spazzed out for a while and slug it was happy crawling around and <clears throat> just from that soybean seed being treated with that neonic and the neonic is a uh, neuro neurologic uh, affects the insects neurologically. <clears throat> Me and Dave don't get along with big words, so you know what I'm talking about. But that was just a huge eye opener. I was a big advocate of, of seed treatment earlier on there. It made the beans look pretty, bean leaf beetles look pretty, and I convinced neighbors to do it. All of a sudden, I went cold turkey. Uh, that next spring, I seen Tucker talking somewhere. He's like, hey, he's like, I just planted 600 acres of soybeans without seed treatment. He's like, why did you do that? I was like, well, you showed us that video. Yeah, but just do it on a couple acres. Like, I don't do things small. We just, we did it before, we can do it again. It put $9,000 in my pocket that year. Easiest money I ever made. It's not about getting more yield to be profitable. And I'm sure a lot of farmers in here are, are realize that, but there's a lot of traditional commercial ag out here that is solely focused on yield, yield, yield to be profitable. Just don't look at the markets today. There's nothing profitable about that at all. <clears throat> so the whole journey of trying to figure out how to get more beneficials into our system, beneficial insects to help combat the, the, our negative ones. And <clears throat> my agronomist, I had a visit out to Gabe Brown's uh, in this time frame, and he'd come home. He's like, we got to get more armor in the system. we got to get more armor in the system. He's like, well, we're burning our eye off of three inches. We're, we can't build armor. We're in Pennsylvania. I don't want my soils to be cold, and we can't plant. I want to plant in April, and blah, blah, blah. So finally, I was like, we're going to plant into some green, <clears throat> some bigger rye. We were planting green into some shorter rye, but it was, it was time just to see that we can make it happen and everybody's like oh my lord is that toxic that's in the rye it's gonna kill your rye don't do it it's impossible um 
I'm, I was young and dumb. I don't listen very well. There was a neighboring Mennonite fellow that we talked to, that we farmed next to, um, and his seed rep was in to talk to him, and he seen me playing all this corn green, and he said, I have an apology to tell you. I said, what's that? He said, uh, my seed guy told me your corn is going to be dead. I said, okay. He said, your corn's not dead. He said, it looks better than mine. I said, I don't want to tell you. He said, well, I'm going to buy a seed from somebody else. I said, that's a good, that's a good observation. <laughs> Early on, we were just planting right into it. We were running a road cleaner. Um, I wasn't real worried about having a, a clean row. We were just doing it to see what happened. Um, somebody forgot to tell this corn it can't grow and rye. And what we started to realize is that very little slug damage at all. And what we started to realize was Tooker and the research he was doing is we burn everything down, there's nothing green. You plant corn or soybeans, first thing that's green that comes through the ground is your cash crop. What are they going to eat but that cash crop? So we learned real quick we needed this bait and trick. Uh, trick and bait, whatever I call it. It's not what I meant, but is to provide a uh, uh, that's what bait and switch. And it really worked. But boy, does it freak all the neighbors out. Um, it's hard being a younger guy. I'm good friends with one of the biggest producers in the area, and he just, he sent me a text now and then, and he just laughed. <clears throat> the problem is, his planter guy said he'll never plant through this big rye, so they're never going to do it. But they're doing a lot of cover crop in our area, and they're doing a good job. But it's amazing, again, like, what, like I named this, named the presentation, that it's, we were doing all these things for the wrong reasons. And, each step that I've taken, I'm sure Dave experienced this, is you're not sure why you're doing it or what you're going for, but all of a sudden, the one thing that you were trying to go for, and it adds about three or four other things that you've learned and added to your operation. Um, and I think that's when things started to really make sense, uh, learning about, learning from a lot of the experts, Dave, uh, Gabe Brown, and Ray, we started to learn about the real reasons of why we're going down this road. Um, we started to learn about regeneration. That's a big word, but I think we've all learned to understand that quite well. Diversify our operations. And learn how it protects our operations. To rebuild and restore. Um, this is, a, again, diversity. I, this is some non-GMO canola that I've been growing for a... Uh, small individual, young, uh, single individual that's crushing and bottling his own non-GMO oil. Everybody told me that canola is a non-GMO, but this canola actually comes from over in Europe, where it is actually a true non-GMO canola. Um, so that we buy any non-GMO canola in the U.S., it'd probably be contaminated with some seed of some sort. Because this stuff grows everywhere once you come by it. <coughs> As I was saying, the paths we start to go down, it's amazing how we get focused on, I want to build armor on my, on my soul. So we plan the bigger covers, and it's like, that's my solely focus on, that's just what I want is bigger armor. Um, we start to realize planting green helps us combat slugs. And it starts to build more armor on the surface and realize that our infiltration rates have went up significantly. We don't have ponding in our fields anymore. If we'd have five inches of rain, we'd have some ponding. But like Dave said, it goes away really fast. And the armor provides habitat. I mean, my chemical guy is trying to sell me $2.50 worth of something to kill everything in the soil. And now I'm building armor to try and build and protect everything in the soil. And with the help of Christine Jones, some of you have heard her, she really opened my eyes, being on my operation, the, the importance of having some green cover that turns into armor later in life that 
the amount of solar that those covers absorb from the sun and pump that liquid carbon into the system is so simple yet huge in our operations. And again, I was just trying to grow larger covers, provide armor for my soils, and provide habitat, and yet she throws another uh, a moment where realizing we're allowing our covers to grow taller and larger, we're providing our soils to capture that liquid carbon probably another 30 days longer than anybody else. So, again, the, the web we weave, the web I weave is just, I, it was hard for me to sit down and put this all together, truthfully. 2013 is when we really jumped off the bandwagon and started planning some headed out ride. My dad freaked out then, boy, he was like, you are not doing that in my operation. So I did. I did it on 50 acres of my own. I was freaking out quite a bit. This stuff was as tall as the front tires. Had no idea if this was going to grow. And uh, we got it to grow and started to realize that this rye was sticking around a lot longer creating unique habitat all year long underneath this. So I, I felt pretty good about this. That again, I, I bucked the trend of the naysayers and any university in our operation that's been there, and not too many universities come to my operation because I'm usually out in left field quite a bit. Talked about our soybeans. My goal is trying to figure out how do we get more armor in our soybean fields. And the only way I could come to that conclusion is we had to plant our soybeans green. So we would actually, we would actually apply a herbicide that a buddy of mine found by accident. We would apply Canopy, EX, and some 2,4-D early to help combat our mare's tail issues. But it won't kill a rye. It would stun it, not kill it. We plant the rye, beans into the rye, let things grow together. And again, we started to realize the benefits of having something green. I wanted to build armor in my fields is one of my focus was. And then I'm like, huh. So by the slug, underneath this corn plant, it's like, oh, there's a bean plant. I know what that bean plant is. I'm going to go chew on that. It didn't care. It's like, ah, oh, here's rye. I'm satisfied. Everybody's freaking out about this slug issue, and we've learned to how to work with them until we find a cure or find that we've built our systems up enough. I, I truly feel that our systems are just out of whack. There's something we haven't brought back into the equation to balance nature out. There's something that's just out of balance with this slug issue. Um, then again, we would, uh, these were Roundup Ready soybeans. We'd come back in, burn the beans, burn the rye off. And it was kind of freaky. Again, you can see your soybeans, your neighbors can see your soybeans, you're like, what are you doing? And then, yet again, I realized the habitat we're creating for beneficial spiders. Um, just the amount of protection that's there by changing one little simple practice on your operation. Um, we're still doing this today. This was probably one of the biggest eye openers on my operation. We had a five inch rain event in an hour and a half. So the amount of rain Dave just had here in the last day, it came in a day and a half. And I was ready to start building my ark because there was water flapping up against the side of my house. My biggest concern was after I walked out in the morning, I seen this thing cutting right down by my house, cut right through my yard, was what do my fields look like? Uh, that was my biggest fear. Uh, we got, some of you guys have been to my operation. Um, Dave showed me a real big hill he has over here. Dave's been to my house, he knows what my hills are like. There's a reason why this water went down through here. It's the only place where it went. I had a cover crop plot up on top of my hill. Um, soybean stubble, nothing on it. Again, it's another learning opportunity. I made this plot up, not thinking about it, but what's growing over here is so just soybean stubble. 
Nature's going to cover itself. It wants to have something growing on it. Constantly. And here's the big rise. So you can catch the yields in the first one. This was 202 bushel. And the soybean stubble. 202 in the burnt off rye. And 203 in the big rye. So everybody's going to say, well, why in the world do I want to cover crop? You've got the same yield. And I won't argue with them. I won't argue with them at all. Did it deter me from keeping on doing what I'm doing? Nope. Because in the, after this rain that we had, this was the, the plot. This was the big rye that we know now that we have close to eight inches of water infiltration out. That's huge. Here's a soybean soap. Big ride. So even so. This probably soaked in. You can see the aggregate stability on top of this underneath that soybean stubble. I mean, we have good aggregate stability without covers. But how much rain does it take to move soybean stubbles? A lot. This is pretty flat. And it's hard for me to be flat. This is a flat part of the field. It was uh, it doesn't roll down a hill to here, but it's pretty flat. So it went rather than soybeans. I was I was blown away and I knew then that we were on the right path. No, we're not gonna have a five inch rain event in an hour all the time, but how many times do we keep saying every year, boy, we don't we don't get the easy rains like we used to get. There's things that are changing in our environment and I'm I'm no expert on it, but I do know that we need to learn how to protect our soils and learn how to work uh, with different different management decisions to stop things like this. Again, another learning observation. Um, I didn't realize this were taking these pictures. Actually, Christine Jones brought this to my attention when she was walking through my fields. What, what, what do we see? It's kind of hard to see, but everybody knows to have good nitrogen availability or corn. What, what do we want in the bottom of our leaves? Well, what's the first thing we want in the bottom of the corn? One that bottom leaf left, leaf left yet. Over here in this no-till corn to soybean stubble. Where is the leaf at? Oh, there's one. It's brown. Yep, it's going down the wormhole. <laughs> and here again, we have leaves in the bottom. They're dying up. They're pretty green. Um, again, another lesson of why we're on the right path. After I started to realize that we need to be planting in more of these big covers, uh, I got to borrow Charlie Martin's six row corn planter was in our area. Um, Jay, how long do I have to? Yeah, while. I know, I'm just trying to pace myself. <laughs> <clears throat> I had to borrow Charlie Martin's corn planter. Brought it there, we planted six acres. His one boy was along, I ran it, and I, I was sold. Um, I knew this was, this was the future. So, Charlie actually, before Charlie got to work with Dawn, um, one thing I did not like with Charlie's first planter is you can actually lift that whole stick of planter off of the ground with his cover crop roller. And we all know we need to keep the row units in the ground. His boy was along with me. He's like, oh, smash that thing down, lift that planter up so you can smash that cover. He's like, yeah, but let's go back there and there ain't no corn going in the ground. He goes, oh, you got a good point. <laughs> I said, we want this to work. We need to make sure that it does not affect the planter. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my concern was with the hydraulics on the planter for the cover crop roller. I have a 15 inch corn planter. Kinsey planter that has pusher units. <coughs> My goal was to make something that mimicked the same pressure on the back of the plane. So we made a front row unit, used the same amount of springs and paralleling arms as the back of the planter. Uh, Charlie made me the rollers and um, we, uh, we ran that for the first year with Huge, huge success. Um, again, uh, looking at this, 
planning. We uh, run with a pretty good sized road cleaner. Felt we were doing things right in my in my view. Um, getting these results, and I was ecstatic. Except I had one of our main Penn State University folks. Greg Roth stopped at my operation. Um, he wasn't hard to find my farm. He just followed the big rod. He just kept driving. He wasn't planted yet. It was like May 15th. He stopped in. He was at a neighboring farm. He's like, I heard about your planter. I'm going to come look at it. It's like, cool. And he was looking at it. He's like, turned around. He's like, so you're going to plant that one field there? It's like, oh, yeah, that field. Another field over there. 20 acres over there. Wow, you're, you're serious. I said, well, so we got like 600 acres we're going to plant like this. Well, you, you really think this works? <laughs> and I get so tired of that mentality of, well, we didn't test it yet. How do you know it works? Again, I've never been one to follow the footsteps of any university. They're trying to catch, I follow footsteps that Dave Brand <laughs> and other farmers that are out there push the envelope. Um, there's a lady our church was doing her little research project and she, uh, she came to my operation. She was reading this fancy book about adop adoptation of new technologies. My dad told her about hybrid corn. And so she wanted to pick our, our brains on how hybrid corn was adopted and this and that. And we got to talk about cover crops and my cover crop roller and what we're doing with that. And it, it blew her mind about what we were doing and how it was beneficial to the environment. She said, well, what university extension did you learn this from? I says, uh, me, myself, and I. And she just looked at me. It's, I said, universities are starting to test what we've been doing for two or three years. She said, well, where did you learn this from? How do you adopt something that universities didn't do? And I said, it's, it's the innovative farmers that are out there that have mortgages to pay and that are changing, changing what they're doing on their operations, not because of universities. And a couple years, about a year or two later, uh, Penn State had some research farms. They bought a 4 oak corn planter, put the rollers on it, planted the corn. I don't have the pictures of it, but uh, John Tooker asked me to come down and look at it. It's, it's a Farming for Success Day. He said, this corn looks like crap. You need to come look at it. He said, because you plant 700 acres and it looks nothing like this, he said. So I went down, me and my agronomist, draw a choice, and we went down to look at it. And it was a terrible stand of corn that they're gonna showcase it to all these farmers that day and ask a few questions. And it was really dry, and we had this issue, we had that issue, and the farm manager's like, hey, I had to get this corn planted, we just jumped on the planter, we just planted it. It's like, did you get off the look if it was going in the ground? Well, it was going in the ground, and we dug the corn up, it was about probably three quarters of an inch deep. And my grandma said, well, what herbicide did you use? Now this is the universe, you're supposed to know everything and tell us farmers how to do everything properly. And they used bicep, uh, dual, and 2,4-D. How deep are we supposed to plant corn to not get 2,4-D injury? At least an inch, inch and a half. He had 2,4-D injury not getting his corn in the ground deep enough because it was too hard because of the rye. So is it the rye's fault? Or is it the manager's fault for not getting off and setting his plant a little bit deeper? It's, it's, uh, it's real hard to buck up against um, things like that. So I had to stand there all day long and explain the, what it would look like in my operation, but it didn't look like that on at the university farm, I'm not sure. So challenges every year that some people fear about. Um, some reason I became the rye king. Dave was talking about um, getting paid to be a uh, somebody to call and talk to, and I was like, two years ago, I wish I got paid very phone call. I got called about from Canada. I think that's when Blake and I got to know each other, but. Just because I planted the rye, all of a sudden I was like the expert on how to do things. And um, 
I gave a lot of farmers confidence in what they were going to do was going to work. Um, it's, it's, you talk to some NRCS people and they recommend two bushel a rye. And I jump up and down and scream and carry on and it's like, no, that's not right. Like, oh yeah, we that's by the book. It's like then that farmer calls me. He's like, yeah, I put two bushel on. Then I put four ton of chicken litter on it and I hang the phone up. <laughs> then he calls me back. Well, what's wrong? It's like you put four ton of chicken litter on two bushel rise. What's wrong with that? He's like, what's really thick now? He's like, ah, I'm not gonna be able to plant through it. It's like I, I know you're not. <laughs> well, you're supposed to help me through this. It's like. You should have started back in October when you planted this rye. And it's like, well, they tell me we need to plant it this thick. I thought a little more, little more, little's good, a little more is better. Colin Sice is the moron mentality comes into play all the time. More on the better. Or is more on, I forget what, but. This is a, how, how thick do you think this rye is? A bushel? Two bushel? This is about 20 pound of rye. This is a rye, pea, vetch mix. Um, there's a little bit of a pattern to this. You can see it. Um, we spread manure on this. And I, another thing, here we are learning things about our operation. I have a small four inch spreader on the back of my truck. We're spreading 60 feet wide. Come to realize real quick, I don't have a good pattern behind my truck. Right behind the truck, there's a bad pattern. But this manure was spread early. The rye was only a couple inches tall. But we got a lot of wind last, two you did last year. Knocked us all down. I live back here and I come out of this lane, I was about crying because I had no idea how we're going to plant through this. So in two weeks, we uh, devised a way to be able to get through that rye. And uh, I, I remember I walked into my shop with a handful of metal and laid it down and one of my guys that worked for me is a good fabricator and he's just like, now what are we going to make? I said, we need to make something to lift that rye up and get it out of the way. So I was like, I'm not going to have a failure at this planting green. Of course it kept raining, it kept raining and for too long. Uh, we got this all glued together. We actually put one of the snouts out on a little UTV and ran around the field. Neighbors didn't know what we were doing, but we had this, we were going crossways things, trying to make it not work, and it, I was, I was impressed. A lot of people call it a little cotton picker snout. It's whatever you want to call it, but it, it worked pretty good. Um, soon to realize that it was clean in a row, really good. It will get the seed, put the planter into the ground, and uh, without any road clear then. So, a couple years before, I actually took my big road cleaners off that, that cover crop roller. We actually made a little wheel. I didn't want to, I wanted to do less disturbance. Um, but the deeper we get into this, we realize the less disturbance we do, the better even in that little single row for that corn plant. But everyone's like, well, we need that perfect stand of corn. I was like, well, I, I'm not fussing about that perfect stand of corn. Um, I'm not gonna take credit for this, but Dave said it last night, and I know Blake heard it. Talked about these big covers and it laying down, and each time it rains, Dave said he feels he gets some compost tea effect from that cover crop, that companion crop. And I'm like, like, so that's why I love this guy. He said he's always thinking. And it's so simple. And it's, it, it's true. We have a diverse mixture of legumes. We have a crimson. We have our rye. There's nutrients in that rye, even though well, it has taken up a lot of nitrogen. We got some brassicas in here. It's just amazing the root structure that, that, that the soil all takes on once you start planting into this big cover. And the infiltration, I think, is what's, every time I drive by a field, or drive by these fields coming in here, I'm just, I'm sure Dave's the same way. You know, you, you start to realize how you can fix things. You don't want to be a know-it-all, but you know how to fix things. Farmers' fields, I mean, fix their issues. And 
I do a lot of custom application with lime and fertilizer. And I come across farms that are good farmers and they're no-tillers. They still got washes and they're cover cropping, but they're burning their cover off and it's about four inches tall. And I put a couple jabs in there, like, no, you let this grow a little bit more that you might get a little bit of infiltration. Oh, I can't, I can't plant through that. It can't be done. It's like, well, you're losing about 100 ton of topsoil off this farm every year, so I don't know what you can or can't, but you need to do something now. And it's, I don't know why it's so hard to adopt that. The realization of the less the servants, the better, and keeping that, that uh, row clean 100% isn't always mandatory. Last year being so wet, planting with some of this big rye, we had some stand issues. Um, a little concerned that we're having some uneven disturbance. My planter 10 years ago was decked out with every, every any type of bling that a farmer could buy back then. There's so much bling now that a farmer could buy on his planter, you don't even, you lose track of it. But my planter is back to no rope cleaner, no nitrogen colder. We're putting a little nitrogen out the back. And I have a cast iron frozen wheel in the back of my planter to plant into some of this big rye they'll get the seed slot closed. And we're having some excellent stands out the back of it. <coughs> Next step of the <coughs> non-sayers is planting untreated seed. We've been doing it for quite a few years with corn. I mean, with soybeans, uh, we've been working with a little bit with corn. Um, this is this year, that same field that had the flat rye in it, uh, planted non-GMO corn to that untreated. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's truly an act of God that this is growing. I mean, it's impossible it doesn't have seed treatment. <laughs> in the six foot tall rye, it's gotta be dead, right? Everybody says it, it's gotta be dead. I love going the opposite direction that uh, the herd is going. It just come to realization how much if we let the soil function in the natural system, it'll take care of itself. <clears throat> this is one of Jonathan Lundgren. Some of you heard Jonathan talk. Uh, I should have had this slide a little bit earlier in my presentation, but I just love how the whole ramifications of allowing our covers to grow bigger, eliminate insecticide passes almost eliminating them all together and adopting an IPM approach, integrated pest management approach. I lean a little harder on my agronomist, make him earn his per acre charge and actually scout a field now instead of just, oh, you're doing Roundup Ready, you're good, we'll check it in the fall. He's got to scout my field now. Tell me what's going on. Find out what bag of insects we have. Because every, the only good bug is not a dead bug. And that's been our mentality for a lot of years. If it's green, it's gotta have something bad in it. And it's, that's why it's so unique, bringing farmers together like this and learn to lean on other farmers. I mean, there's a group of us that have a little group going on and we stretch from different parts of Canada to southern states to mid state the U.S., you got to have a network of like-minded individuals to share and bounce ideas off of because you're not the only nuts one out there wanting to try different things. <clears throat> and this is why the bat, uh, every good bug is not a dead bug because the insects are most diverse animals in the planet. And I, I love how my chemical guy, he'll, he'll call me up. He'll even scout my fields, but he'll call me up and be like, hey, we're seeing aphids on such and such farm. We're like, better order some chemicals up. It's like, okay. <laughs> Did you look at my fields? Well, no, I didn't look at your fields. Everybody else is spraying. You better get your spray. Nah, I'm good. Well, you have aphids. Like, yeah, I got some aphids, but my ground is checked. And we're within range. There's this thing called uh, oh, I can't think of the, the threshold. The threshold wall. Why do you want to wait until it gets past it? Like, well, why do I want to kill everything that's eating my aphids and kill myself in the short two 
months later, one even we get another hit again later. Well, then you spray it again. I said, sound like there's only one guy winning out of this thing, and it's not me. This is when Blake and I got to know each other. Um, this is some non-GMO corn two years ago. Uh, playing with some big covers. And I sprayed this cover with Roundup. I got a lot of questions. We, uh, I heard Paul Yasa talk a little bit about this green ooze that comes out of some of these covers. And I've heard it and didn't think much of it. I've heard some other talk, talked with Blake a little bit about this. Some other farmers are plant some non-GMO corn and had some issues with um, taking out some corn, but glyphosate after, before it was even emerged yet. This uh, corn was planted, what's funny is, it's a unique example. I did some pig grazing. I had some you might have seen. I have a mobile hog grazer that has a fence around it that I move around the field. The pigs had this all grazed off right here. Very little cover crop here. And we barely dig that corn there, but it, it really knocked the tar out of the rest of this corn. Where my dad switched the Roundup to Gramoxa in another field, it was a night and day difference. Let's just say I'm very, very cautious and I watch the questions on what we do in my operation these big covers. Um, we are predominantly using a Gramoxone product to burn down because of <clears throat> some issues like this that we've seen in my operation. I don't want to bash glyphosate. It's a great tool. Just learn where to use it properly is, is, what, I, is what my recommendation is. So what's new on my farm? Again, no, it's not a tornado. I think it's just a little more. Is I love trying to find new new practices on my operation. There's been a lot of talk on Twitter about relay cropping, and um, there's some guys that have been doing it very successfully for quite a few years. And it was time I took that took that challenge seriously. And um, this is 30 inch wheat planted here. Did with my corn planter, threw it in end of October. I had no idea what I'm doing, but we threw it out there. <coughs> my goal is, is we're going to uh, plant 30 inch beans into these, into this wheat. Again, trying to learn how to maximize probability off of every acre. So I've been planting my beans green into the rye. And we terminate the rye because the rye does have an allelopathic effect on your crops when you let them grow together. That's why all the agronomists always said that my corn is going to die because of the allelopathic effect. <clears throat> when you let them grow together for too long, then yes, it does be detrimental. So in my beans, I do terminate that rye about 20, 30 days afterwards. But I feel as Gabe always, Gabe Brown talks about loss opportunity. Like there's that small grain we have spending money to spray it off. Why don't we capture that opportunity? Try making a little money with it. Again, I tell this to my dad and he puts the brakes on. I showed him a YouTube video, they was pretty cool about it. He punched the numbers of what the guys are making profit per acre. And then he's like, why aren't we doing more of this? It's like, well, just give me a little time. So we're spraying out our, our cover crop our rye with a herbicide, spent it, who knows, probably $10 with the application and everything. It's like, why, why don't we utilize this grain and relay some soybeans in this, harvest a little bit of grain. We might not maximize our soybean yields, but maybe we'll bring in 
$40 to $50 to harvest, harvest, harvesting a little bit of small grains rather than spending 10 so we're 40 ahead. And these are just, I think these are low numbers. Everybody I've been talking to, I'm definitely on the low side. I'm going to get my slug benefit of having something green growing there, continuing with my soybeans. When we harvest that small grain, we're going to have uh, we're going to have armor. We're going to have habitat, and we're going to have more profit in my pocket. I can't wait to get my neighbors talking about this one because it's out along the road. Usually, I do this stuff in the back side of my farm, but this farm this farm have to be right out in front. So it, it's, I challenge you to really try something new on your operation every year. If you aren't trying something new every year, I feel like I'm going backwards. Um, I'm, I'm pretty wound up about this. Pretty wound up, I'm gonna get the neighbors talking. And uh, I'm, I'm excited that it's gonna take my operation a little bit different direction. The problem is it's gonna be a little more management. And a lot of guys, probably out here, they love to plant their corn. They probably just got back from Florida. Getting ready, to, everybody's getting things ready to plant, plant your crop, go back down south. This is going to take a little more management through the summertime to get this all done, but I have a goal of relay cropping 700 acres of my operation if it all pans out. And if I ever come back again or hear me somewhere else, you might hear how that went. Again, this, is talk, this has been talked a lot tonight, it's today so far, but surround yourself, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, it's kind of unique, I'm on Twitter, you know, when I talk some, gentlemen come up and introduce himself this morning already, don't be afraid to do that. I, I, somebody asked me here the other day, I was driving in here talking to some guys, they were like, how do you ever get into public speaking? I was like, I think that into public speaking, it kind of found me. And FFA, public speaking, was not the competition I went for. I went for travel driver. But it's, it's kind of fun going around, talking about some things that you really believe in and enjoy, and to share your experiences. So don't be afraid to surround yourself with positive people. Just because they say that it can't be done doesn't mean that it can't. Um, Something we're changing in our operation this year. We've gone to 100% non-GMO. And I called my chemical guy up. He's like, hey, like, we need to sit down and talk about chemicals. He's like, oh, it's great. It's like, I'm going non-GMO. What? Why are you going on non-GMO? What, what, what are you trying to prove? He's like, I saved $30,000 on seed over my whole operation. Oh, you're going you're gonna to lose that in yield drag. You know that, right? I was like, we've been planting 300 acres for the last couple of years of non-GMO corn. I said, it's been some of our top yielders. Well, he didn't want to say. His tune complaint changed his As soon as you hit them in their pocketbook, they really squirm. Why is it wrong for a farmer to take matters into his own hand and control his profitability? Your suppliers won't work with you, definitely find somebody that will. Because there are a lot of open minded suppliers out there. I was really close to changing if he didn't change his tune with me. I thank everybody for this opportunity. Any questions? I am on Twitter. Um, and I can get on Facebook now. Um, don't be afraid to follow or reach out.